Frank Smith, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. I'm very happy to be here. So you are an assistant professor of biology at the University of North Florida. Uh, you're a PhD and uh, you study tardigrades, which I am super stoked about. <laughs> yeah, I, I could tell. I saw on your, uh, your, your webpage you had some pictures of some tardigrades, some nice videos and actually correctly identified. So that's that's really great. Oh, that's awesome. That's good to hear. And, and yeah, I mean, for people who don't know me outside of the podcast, I was a Twitch streamer last year. I was live streaming some tardigrades that actually I want to talk to you about because I found them on my balcony. That's so really they weren't neat. in moss. They weren't right. in lichen. They're in the concrete um, uh, pockets of the balcony in the hundreds. Wow. And so... Yeah. I saw on your uh, your your webpage were both species that you identified um, in those cracks or the Ramazodes and the Milnesium. Yeah, yeah, Milnesium. Sometimes I'll find one, but it's okay. literally one out of like a few hundred. But it, there are species that I haven't identified yet. So, okay. um, but it's very it's very curious, don't you think? Yeah, that is really weird. Uh, so tip, the typical places where I think of tardigrades uh, living and the places that I look for, because I do, I do occasionally look for wild tardigrades. Uh, um, and where I'll look is either in like leaf litter, um, in moss, which is everybody thinks of moss. Uh, but I actually have the most like the most luck in lichens. I buy, I get like really dried lichens and like put those in water, tear them up and just wait a little bit and look for tardigrades. So I've never heard of any living on concrete and cracks. So there must be some like maybe some spongy material between that maybe stays wet sometimes and they're just living in that. But what are they know. eating? I don't know. So that's really That's the thing, right? I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I'm going to hold up a little sample here. You're not going to, I mean, it's all just debris from the, from the concrete so mm -hmm. to describe it to my listeners. It looks like a uh, little you know, dust and sand, but this is essentially what I'm collecting. Um, maybe I'll send you some pictures, but I wanted to bring that up because, um, and I'm glad that you said that you mostly find them in lichen because that's what I've been telling, you know, newbies who want to find yeah. tardigrades. I'm like, you know what? Skip the moss. Yeah, Go I, for the lichen. That, that's where I, I find them in forests. I always skip the moss and go for the lichen, I have to say. Maybe, maybe I'm missing out on a whole bunch of like really interesting diversity, but I just go for the lichen. But here, here I live in uh, Jacksonville, right on the coast. So I also look for marine tardigrades, which is pretty cool. So we dig down in the uh, the sediment at the ocean and pull it out and um, do some methods to extract the animals out of the sand, which is really neat. And okay. the marine tardigrades are really wild looking. Yeah, I, I was just I, I was going to interrupt you right there because I wanted to know if you had to tell somebody who's not a scientist, you know, someone who's living on the sh on the shore of the ocean yeah. somewhere, and they want they too want to look for marine tardigrades. Yeah. What's the easiest like what's the easiest way to find them? Uh so it's it's not really too easy but it's it is is possible. So we actually made a contraption. And we made this contraption. I guess we could just I could just like get we made it out of something like this, you know. We just like this I think it's there's Indian food in here, you know, before. But we cut a little hole in the bottom and bought some really fine mesh from Amazon. We got like a micron like micron scale mesh. Uh super glued that to the bottom of this uh to like a little jar like this or a little beaker like this and uh, cut a hole in the bottom and super glued that mesh there. And um, what we did was we would put some sand uh, into a, another container uh, with some salt water and then try to kind of pour off the salt water and then we would shock them with, uh, with tap water. So there'd be, there'd be a shock where the salt water is gone and when, and it's mostly tap water. At that point, they kind of just get so shocked that they let go of whatever they're holding on to and it, Turns out a lot of these marine animals are really good at like grabbing hold of sand. So at that point, they're kind of like floating around in the liquid. And so we had poured that liquid through our sieve that we made, wait till all the water went through, and then we'd take this and rinse it off with uh, salt water. So we just bought, we bought uh, our own salt to make salt water. And you can get this at pet stores. People that have like marine uh, tanks use this. It's called like instant, instant C or something like that. I know it's it's uh it's not very expensive. So we'd put it in here, and and the the mesh is so uh, fine scale that the water doesn't go through very quickly. So we just give it a swirl, put it in another dish, and at that point, like most of the sediment had already settled out in and on the other end of the spectrum. So we ended up with mostly just like a little bit of sand and all kinds of little critters in a, in in our dish that we looked at. And so uh um. And you can find this protocol online some places. And I, I don't know if you have links that are make available to your listeners because I could find. Yeah, absolutely. I could, yeah, I'll find some links that kind of provide some detail about this. 
Um, but uh, uh, we'd find all kinds of animals. We wouldn't always find tardigrades, uh, but we'd find um, nematodes and uh, little gastrotrichs and um, all kinds of little critters doing this. Maybe some of them had actually blown in from the uh, uh, from the shore. Maybe we find things that weren't even supposed to be there, you know. But um, we found all kinds of animals. But we did find tardigrades, which was really cool. That's awesome. And yeah, I mean, the, like you were saying, the marine tardigrades are completely different species or completely different structure is it true that they um they don't have the mechanisms for like cryptobiosis because they don't need it so that is my understanding is that that is true but there there are some species that primarily live in marine habitats that do show some degree of cryptobiosis uh and these are animals that live uh um like in environments where sometimes they do dry so there is there is some speculation that this ability may have come from animals that did live in coastal environments where it could have dried uh, potentially, but most of those animals that do live in uh, the marine environment, uh, they're part of this big group of animals called uh, the heterotardigrada. The marine ones are part of a lineage that we call arthrotardigrada within that uh, lineage of, tar of heterotardigrades. Um, so most of those, as far as we know, don't have that cryptobiotic ability but on the other hand they wouldn't need it right they're in the ocean and the ocean doesn't normally uh, dry out so which of the two are most studied land tardigrades or marine tardigrades um i would say definitely the i would say definitely the land tardigrades are more studied and i think it's just because they're easier to find but there's a, a lot of interest in the tardigrade community in the uh, marine tardigrades so there's there there's a lot of interest in marine tardigrades and People, people have really looked. They've done a great job of uh, really describing this diversity that are in marine environments. Um, I think some estimates are that, you know, I'd say right now we probably have about 1,300 species of tardigrade that uh, has been identified and described. Uh, there's probably estimates range between like maybe like 3,000 to 5,000 more uh, species to be discovered. And if I'm rem remembering correctly, I think most of that's th that diversity that we're expecting to find is in marine uh, habitats, marine environments. Yeah. Okay. That's very, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess it makes sense that it would just be harder to study something that's harder to find. Yeah. Um, and also harder I think the, well, uh, and, and the interests of the, the researchers, right? Like in Canada, where I live, it took a scientist, a tardigrade researcher from Maine to find the first marine tardigrades on the east coast of Canada. She found right. them in uh, in PEI, where yeah. I'm moving, actually. So, oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. so I'll, be, I'll be looking for them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a, also a limitation of resources, I would imagine. Right. Um, and that there's, no matter where you live in the world, you can find tardigrades, but not everybody lives near the ocean, right? So uh, not, not not that many of the uh, tardigrade labs are near the ocean. So um, definitely there's a lot of diversity to be found. And even, even around the ocean, it's easiest to find tardigrades that live close to the shore. You know, if, if they're living further out, then they're going to be really hard to find. So there's quite a bit of diversity yet to be found. There's people that are um, looking for this diversity, but there, there really isn't that many people looking for it. Just to give you an idea, when I go to the tardigrade meeting, where all the tardigrade taxonomists come together and talk about what they discovered recently. There's like a hundred people there and not all of them are taxonomists, you know, like I'm not a taxonomist. So everybody that studies tardigrades convenes at these meetings. There's only about a hundred people in the world like that are really actively studying tardigrades. So. Yeah. And many of them are not on Twitter, unfortunately. And, and the reason I'm, I say that is because I, when I found these tardigrades, I couldn't find any literature about tardigrades living in concrete or like, a, especially in such large numbers. I yeah. mean, every time I go out and collect a, a water sample, you know, with the rain, it just kind mm -hmm. of sits on the balcony. Every time I can collect in a, in a Petri dish of, of the size that I showed you, 30 to 40. That's tardigrades. amazing. That's a lot it of, that's, incredible. that's a score. Yeah. Yeah. You could prop, I mean, You've got a system you can start to study, right? I mean, you can probably yes. find embryos in there. You can find whatever you want. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, I, we, it, it it shocked me that there wasn't any research on this yet. You know, I I don't. I've never heard of tardigrades living on uh, uh, in concrete. I do know um, there's a like a like a real good uh, tardigrade research group that um, works in Denmark, and uh, the the leader of this group is this guy named uh, Reinhard Christensen. Reinhard Christensen is famous among zoologists because he's 
one of the last people to discover like a whole phyla of animals. So he's discovered like phyla of animals, which is the biggest grouping of animals. So, you know, we thought we knew all the phyla. Reinhardt discovers new phyla. I think he's discovered three phyla of animals in his career. But he he started out studying tardigrades and he still loves tardigrades. So, you know, when I see him, he has these really cool, like he has this really nice shirt with these on his on his uh, uh, collar there. Somebody stitched like tardigrades on, on his collar. It just looks so nice. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I know that their group for one species of, uh, that they study a lot, it's called, uh, Echiniscus bigranulatus. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a heterotardigrade species. It's not one of the marine tardigrade species. It's a terrestrial heterotardigrade species. So like other heterotardigrades it has all kinds of weird horns and stuff on its, on its body. Um, but I know that they go out and get them from the roof of their building he has talked about that, and I don't know, I don't know the details about that. Whether it was just, I, I assume that there was like some sort of moss or something lichen growing on their building, but I don't actually know about that. But um, uh, I can definitely put you in touch with people that will be able to that would be cool. tell you more about this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think uh, you know because, uh, and the reason I bring this up with you is because you also study the evolution of these creatures and things like that. And I was like, I wonder if we're tracing also the evolution of like the urban environment. You know, I, I spoke yeah, yeah. with a, a researcher in, in Australia and she was studying the, the uh, like moss in urban environments. So yeah. like, how's that working out? Like how is moss being used in urban, ur- urban environment environments? Where is it, right. you know, where is it growing, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, I was curious to see. So, because, so your research specifically, how far back do you go? So that's, that's the really cool thing. This is the thing that I get excited about. It's like, we're trying to solve mysteries that are probably more than 550 million years old. So we're trying to solve mysteries that, that predate the fossil record. Um, uh, there's, there's been a lot of interest ever since Darwin about how like animals came to be. And it's been really mysterious because, you know, where the fossil record starts, we find animals that look similar to modern animals. Uh, they, they have characteristics that are similar with modern, with modern animals. Now, of course, they look different, but I, but I mean, we can find an animal and be like, that looks like a vertebrate. We can find an animal and be like, that looks like an arthropod or something like that. So we can recognize similarities with modern groups. But uh, the fossil record doesn't go deep enough for us to really learn how those groups came to be. And so with my, uh, my field really takes like developmental biology, genomics, and comparing different animals to get an idea of what these very, very ancient animals look like. And uh, originally, when I was when I was like a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist. So I've moved pretty far beyond that. But actually, I'm going to be an author of my first paleontology paper pretty soon. So I'm excited about that. So uh, cool. paleontologists uh, like to talk to me because we're very interested in the same kind of questions. So. Yeah, I've interviewed a few uh, limnologists, like the people who study diatom fossils and things like that. I, I would imagine it's kind of similar to that. You're going back on very, very, very old fossils. And I guess, uh, I mean, tardigrades do fossilize, right? Uh, so they, they do fossilize. Finding tardigrade fossils is hard because they're so small. I mean, that's the problem. So there is a fossil from, uh, I, I believe it's Cambrian, uh, Upper Cambrian, uh, periods. So this is like 545 million years ago. It might be Ordovician. It might be a little bit uh, more recent than that. But um, there was a fossil that uh, somebody found, described, and thought it might be related to, to tardigrades. But I think most people find that conclusion to be kind of like not really great evidence. It only has three legs rather than four. Um, so there's been a lot of speculation about what that might, that animal, definitely an animal, but how it really relates to tardigrades is unclear. But where we find really cool uh, tardigrade fossils, is in amber, so they'll they'll find uh, fossils of tardigrades in amber, which is really cool. And so, so that clearly that's after the origin of land plants, so that's more recent. But um, I do really like those fossils. We can learn a lot from those fossils too. Do you actually have those fossils on hand? I, I don't have those fossils on hand. Okay. I would I would love to, I, I love holding fossils, and so so you know I went I went to visit some paleontologists that were studying Cambrian fossils, and I think they actually collected these fossils in Canada in the Burgess Shale. And or sorry, no, I think it was Canada, yeah. And um, and uh, I got to hold them, and I was like, whoa, because they're they're cool. like 550 million years old or whatever. So I'm like, don't, don't drop it, don't drop it. But it's really amazing. But I, I've never got to see or hold the the fossils of the tardigrades in amber. But um, but yeah. 
Wow, that is, that is so cool. I It's one of those things that I often, because I've gotten into like rock collecting now too. So I'm always like, oh, I should put one of these rocks under the microscope, you know, because I'm originally from a place in Canada called Sudbury. And that's a place that got formed by meteorite, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole, it's a, like, it's a world-renowned basin that got formed by meteorites. So every time I go back home, I'm like, oh, I should grab more rocks to look at <laughs> yeah. just in case. That would be really cool. I mean, if... Not very many people are looking at rocks under microscopes, looking for looking for fossils. You know, not there's not very many people looking for microscopic fossils. So, um, right. Yeah. So okay, so now you've you've you know gone way back. Uh, what are some of the things that you found? Now I've been going through your research, and I'm seeing that uh, you know you specifically talk about things like segmented tardigrades and 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 um one of the things let me see if i can quote it here um it is how tardigrades lost mid trunk segments what's yes. that all about yeah so that was one of my uh that was probably my biggest discovery so far i'll say and it, it was a really cool one that got it it got i made a lot of traction and every and a lot of people liked it especially the paleontologists that's how they found out about me and so uh what i did was i looked at um, the genomes of tardigrades and compared them to their relatives, which they're related to arthropods, which are also segmented animals. Uh, um, so if you think about like a, if you think about like an insect, they have those three different regions. There's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. We know the thorax is where we see the legs and there's three pairs of legs. Uh, so there's three segments in the thorax, but there's also many segments in the head. So the head is actually made of six segments. It's not just a single segment. And then the abdomen also has a, a, a series of segments also. And if you look at something like a millipede, they have a whole bunch of segments that all have legs in them. And so uh, tardigrades, they're much simpler. They have a head and um, uh, four trunk segments, so four leg-bearing segments. So compared to most arthropods, they're close, you know, potentially their closest relatives, uh, they have much fewer segments. So it was unclear, and the fossil record couldn't help us with this question because the fossil we can't go deep enough to find out. But it was unclear whether, uh, like, the ancestral condition for tardigrades and um, arthropods, that big group of animals, was like a little stubby thing, like a tardigrade, or was it a much more long thing, like an arthropod? So when I went in and looked at the uh, the, the tardigrades, the first thing I noticed was that looking in their genome, there's a whole bunch of genes that control the development of mid-trunk segments in arthropods that were missing in tardigrades. Now we know that those genes should be there. Because they're even in humans, like these genes are ancient, and and in all animals, they they kind of like control a mid region of the body. So that was kind of that was pretty surprising. So we knew these genes that control the the midsection of the uh, the, the body should be there. Um, they're not. Uh, and uh, when we looked at where the remaining genes that kind of set up different regions of the body that say like here's the anterior, here's the middle, and so on, when we looked at where those genes were active during development, I found that uh, they were kind of like only head genes were in, uh, uh, kind of controlling the development of nearly the entire body axis of a tardigrade. So um, when we look at how tardigrades develop, how that whole body axis develops, basically what this demonstrated was that nearly the entire body axis is just related to the head of an arthropod, just the head region. And there's no trunk region. And then there's just a little butt region, like the little posterior part <laughs> is is retained. So I came up with I came up with like a nice name for them. I think some people are throwing some names out uh, to call tardigrades. They're calling them butt heads. I think when I made this discovery <laughs> in the lab I worked in, and I didn't like it, so I came up with the walking heads, which I thought was really much nicer. <laughs> so uh, so basically, they're little heads with legs. Wow. And it pretty much demonstrated that tardigrades they evolved from a, a longer ancestor, so they're not the ancestral condition. They are the derived. Which is kind of surprising and interesting because uh, when I got into this research and thinking about studying tardigrades, I thought they probably were more representative of the ancestor, and I could learn something about how arthropods uh, evolved. And that's my, that was my initial like reason for studying tardigrades. But so many times I've discovered that tardigrades they're they're the weird ones, and I'm learning more about how tardigrades actually evolved than I am about how arthropods evolved. But I'm I'm very happy about it because uh, the, the the it's so interesting and surprising and exciting that. Um, I'm 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 fine to I'm fine to discover things that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, that is a pretty pretty huge discovery, um, and and that's that's just amazing. Does this mean does this change anything about 
you know, if they're like mostly all head, yeah. but I mean, they have, obviously they have legs attached to those segments. Mm-hmm. Um, how is that any different than an arthropod who has a trunk? So, so what this kind of demonstrated uh, was that, uh, and it was something that people had already kind of thought was the case. But if you look, if you look at an arthropod head, you will see appendages. You won't see legs. If you're looking at like an insect or a millipede or a centipede or something like that, you won't see legs. You'll things like things like an antenna that they use to to sense their environment. You'll see uh, you'll see um, appendages like mandibles that they use to crush food. They also have appendages um, like called maxillae that they use to like taste food and manipulate food. So on their head, they have these appendages that are used for sensing the environment, tasting food, manipulating food, and eating food. But uh, uh, paleontologists kind of thought that those appendages actually evolved from legs. And when you look at tardigrades, you see on these segments that are head segments in modern day arthropods, we see legs. That was like, like pretty much closed the door. That was mystery solved. That, that, that hypothesis was proven correct. So it really did relate to, uh, um, to arthropods and like how arthropods came to be in that sense. So it really, it really, uh, supported that hypothesis that, the arthropod head appendages evolved from legs. Wow, that's mind blowing. Yeah. Um, what about so the the thing about the that I find super cute about tardigrades is their hind legs, right? Because oh, they just yeah. kind of like that's drag cute. in the back. Yeah. They don't. They're, they're very different. They're they're oriented completely differently than yeah. the you know three uh, other pairs of legs. Yeah. It, it, and you said that they have a little butt, so I, I would imagine those hind legs are attached to the butt. Yep. So their their body axis, the legs are like basically the most posterior part of their body. In front of the legs, they have in my species anyway. In front of the legs, they have a cloaca, which is where uh, um, uh, they defecate and they also deposit their uh, eggs. Um, so it, that the the legs are the very posterior part of a tardigrade body axis. And and have we have we figured out why those legs are built the way they are? Because it seems to me like they kind of serve zero purpose, <laughs> at least in, that, in my observations. Yeah, that's 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 right. And so we've there's been a lot of speculation that they're, oh they're just using those legs to like grab onto the substrate to kind of hold on to the substrate as they eat, so they don't kind of uh, float away or whatever. And I think that's a good a good hypothesis. Um, and maybe using them kind of like rudders to turn, like oh if you need to turn left, you drop your right foot and it kind of turn this way like that. But I will say, and this, this research isn't published. I don't, I don't think it is public. Cause I saw a talk and I, I'm, I'm this, th- this type of research is kind of far afield for me. So I don't actually remember who did it, which is, that's too bad. But anyway, I did watch some really nice videos of tardigrades walking. So they had, they had a little plate, they had tardigrades walking across the plate and they are filming their legs and how they move to get an ideas, get an idea of whether they were using their legs in like the same way the arthropods use their legs. Uh, and the back legs in these videos, it surprised me because they were moving these legs way more than I would have expected. And I don't, they're, it's unclear like what they're doing, but uh, they are like moving them. They're not just like, like this. They were, right. they were walking with them. Yeah. So it was, it was really surprising to see that, but they didn't seem to be as tightly integrated with the forelimbs as the forelimbs, the, the three, the, the front, three pairs of legs were with each other. They were like, had this kind of pattern and they seemed to be doing something else. But um, that was uh, that was unpublished research that I've seen. I saw at a conference. I, mean, I don't even know if I should be talking about it, but uh, I guess once you see it, it's out in the public, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but um, there, there, there are, what, I guess the point of this whole story is that people are fascinated by that question. <laughs> there are people that are studying it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I was, uh, you know, live streaming a lot on Twitch, people would notice it, you know, just members of the public would be like, what's with the hind legs? And I was like, yeah. well, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, they're just kind of clumsy little creatures yeah. that, you know, they, they de- I, I find they, they definitely depend on their, their front uh, yeah, legs sure. and front claws yeah. to like grab things. And-, and another thing to point out, which is, I think, very important and people don't always appreciate um, like tardigrades are a whole phylum of animals. So we say there, there might be like 3,000 to 5,000 species. That's actually a lot for a phylum of animals. So they're, they're, they're very diverse, you know, uh, for, for, uh, compared to most phylum of animals. Like, yeah, they're not as diverse as vertebrates or especially not as diverse as arthropods. But most other lineages of animals, tardigrades are pretty diverse. And so, you know, when you, when you learn something about tardigrades, uh, for example, how, how this particular species of tardigrades uses, uses its legs, it may not 
that that story may not work for every species of tardigrades. So there's it could be species that are using their back legs in different ways, which would be really interesting to investigate. That's true. And of course, and then you've got you know the marine tardigrades, which is a you know different uh, yeah. different legs and different uh, things like that. Yeah. Um, do all tardigrades have eight legs? Uh, they do. Yeah. So okay. so every species we looked at has eight legs. Um, no variation. Now, if we could find if we could find some variation, that'd be really really exciting. But nobody's nobody's found any variation. Yeah. Well, and that's also very interesting, right? So I mean. You think about a lineage of animals that's tardigrades are most people the estimates are like are like three hundred fifty thousand to five hundred and fifty thousand years old like the, the the group as a whole so if you trace back like the ancestor of a marine tardigrade and the ancestor of a terrestrial tardigrade to their ancestor that's like hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago and over that hundreds and hundreds of millions of years like a new pair of legs hasn't evolved or they haven't lost a pair of legs. This is kind of unusual because in arthropods, we see a lot more variation in how many legs different lineages have. And so it's something I'm kind of interested in is like, why are they stuck with this many legs? And I th in, you know, people that think about the function, they think, well, maybe this, maybe this is just the best you can do. This is the best function. But I suggest, I, I suspect that it's not really that simple and that there really is something that's changed about the development of tardigrades that limits the type of variation that's even possible. And so, uh, uh, you know, why, why it's easy to produce new segments in arthropods, it's not really that easy to change the number of segments in tardigrades. And they're kind of stuck with how many they have. Um, and that's, that's uh, like we, in my lab, we study how segments are produced and compare like their, their process to process of arthropods. And there seems to be a loss of uh, uh, this, this type of developmental mechanism that produces variation in other animals. Hopefully I'm not getting too like, too sciencey over here, but uh no, Maybe, no, I can, I'm, I can, I'm okay. keep going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so in arthropods, all right, in arthropods during development, usually a few anterior segments will develop first, and then the rest of the segments will like pop off in a series called, and, and we call this process posterior growth. And posterior growth is very common. It's very ancient. It's how we develop. So basically our anterior develops first, and then like posterior kind of pops off through this uh, posterior growth mechanism. Um, and so... Tardigrades have lost posterior growth. The segments that they have lost developed by posterior growth in their relatives. So they've lost that mechanism. And you can, you can, you can imagine that if, if it's as simple as just stopping development, like let's say normally you bud this many times, one, two, three, four, five, six times, and it's simple as just stopping that mechanism so that you only budded five times. Now you have five trunk segments rather than six, or you bud an extra time. So now you have six trunk segments rather than five or whatever. You have, this, you have this simple mechanism that produces segments during development, and all you have to do is switch how long this mechanism persists during development to change how many segments you have. In tardigrades, they've lost that mechanism. They only have those anterior segments that don't develop by posterior growth in their relatives, and so uh, in that little posterior part. And so, um, uh, you know, they don't they don't really have that mechanism that's that 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 would be easy to toy around with evolutionarily to produce differences in segment number. And so I think that the loss of that mechanism, which led to their very compact body plan, also kind of, uh, kind of um, constrained them to have this number of segments that they have. But uh, definitely I needed to, to, to investigate that question uh, in much more detail, but um, it's, it's kind of like something I'm very interested in. I like, I like to think about development playing this role in, in influencing evolutionary potential really like developmental mechanism what what some developmental mechanisms are really good at producing variation others aren't and uh, the whole time you're you're saying you're saying this i'm you know in my head i'm wondering wait a minute is it possible that this is why they're almost indestructible i mean you know because they've lost this kind of kind of mechanism to evolve um, is it possible that i mean have you tracked the um, like side by side uh, you know, them losing the, the this ability to to, to evolve um, their segments, for example, um, with the you know the ton state and and this ability to survive harsh environments. Yeah, I haven't I haven't tracked that, but I do have you know colleagues and really close friends that study uh, desiccation tolerance and just tolerance in general general in tardigrades, and uh, we do know that at least the, the the loss of this ability to produce new segments or the loss of posterior growth. And um, this developmental 
mechanism in which all the segments develop at the same time and just end up with like a simple head, which is just a single segment and four trunk bearing segments. We know that's very ancient. That evolved in the in the in an ancestor of all modern tardigrades. Whereas the ability to survive extreme environments probably evolved more recently. And this was probably uh, related to the transition to land. But one thing, but you're but you're exactly right that uh, there is something about this that's related, I think, to their ability to survive uh, these extreme habitats. And so if you think about animals that are able to survive extremes, usually these animals are simple animals. Like simple is good if you're trying to survive extreme environments. And like the loss of this mechanism, the loss of these extra trunk segments, this reduction in size, this all contributed to this like simplicity that makes it makes it easier for the like a simple animal to survive extreme environments or to remain in like a dormant state for a long time compared to a, a, a very complex organism. So if you think about think about a human, you know, if we could turn on some of those tricks that tardigrades use to survive desiccation, we'd still have the problem that uh, rehydrating our body is going to take a really long time where rehydrating hydrating a tardigrade takes minutes or seconds. Um, and so they're not, they're not in the state of like partial hydration and like we would be in. So simplicity is very good if you're trying to survive desiccation, try to survive these extremes that tardigrades survive. Um, and you know, this reduction in body size and reduction in body length is just part of that the evolution of the simplicity or this like miniaturization, we call it. So they're miniaturized animals are much better at surviving than big animals, really. The evolution of simplicity. I really like the way you describe that. It makes it a lot um, easier to understand what happened right. there. Have there been any comparative studies between um, this and, let's say, rotifers, like deloid rotifers, which are mm. also able to, you know, um, undergo desiccation and, and yeah. survive all these, like, extreme uh, things? And I, I always find them side by side with my tardigrade samples, by the way. So yeah, I'm just wondering, too. have yeah. there been like uh, comparative studies? There have, there have been some comparative studies and I've even done some of these studies where we compare tardigrades to rotifers. And in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the genes that are missing in tardigrades also missing in rotifers, Ooh. independent losses. So they've, they've independently evolved this uh, really small body size and at the same time lost similar genes. So I think, I think they are in some ways, um, evolving these, this simplicity independently. And, um, like you said, it's really interesting to think about the evolution of simplicity because many times people have this idea that evolution is always going more and more complex, but that's just not the way it works. It's doing whatever's best, you know, whatever works in a particular environment and some environments simple is better, you know, or many environments really. So simplicity is not unusual to, to lose genes, to uh, lose body parts, to lose even like part of the trunk like that's we're learning that this is not very unusual yeah no you're right i mean when you really think about it um i mean i don't know much about human anatomy but i'm sure that there's there are things that humans have lost over time that we didn't need you know so you know like we've lost our tail more or less you know like, right uh, <laughs> like that so, <laughs> body body hair we've lost that i mean some of us are more uh, furrier than others but uh for the most part, you know, none, none of us are as uh, furry as a, like a like an ape, for example, or like a chimp or a, a gorilla or an orangutan or something like that. So humans are definitely losing losing things. Also, we've lost the tail. We've lost, and that for different reasons. We weren't losing those things because we were we were you know trying to live in an extreme environment like a tardigrade or like a rotifer. But uh, loss is common, though. I mean, that's I guess that's the 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 point. Losing things is almost as common as gaining things. So. Yeah, it's just something I'd never really thought about until you just we started talking about it. it's it, what about it's, it, um it's really interesting. Sorry, I guess I guess the 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 lag of this uh this recording sometimes just interrupts us. Uh but I, I was just about to ask you actually about the gut development. I know that that's another area of your team's research. Mm -hmm. the gut development in a tardigrade. Um it's curious because for people who are new to tardigrades, you look at them under the microscope, you can see everything going in and you can see everything going out. So, uh first before we get to that, can you explain to me how uh a how tardigrades eat and how their gut is uh i mean what is it is it like that does it have intestines does it have a stomach or does it just kind of like wind yeah, through their body how does that maybe work i'll start with a little bit of the anatomy of a tardigrade gut the anatomy of the tardigrade gut is uh, fairly simple but it has features that we can see uh either the same thing in other animals or things that look similar in other animals so they have a mouth 
uh, like uh, other animals. Uh, and most animals do have a mouth, believe it or not. Not all animals have a mouth, but um, most animals have a mouth. And uh, connected to their mouth, they have what's called a buccal tube, which is a hard tube. And the hard tube leads to a muscular pump that we call the pharynx. So in, uh, in many animals, uh, many other animals have a pharynx. Uh, rotifers have a pharynx. And the pharynx is kind of like a pump. It'll pull, th it'll pull things into the uh, digestive tract. The pharynx is connected to an esophagus. And the esophagus is connected to – so the esophagus would be ba basically like similar to our throat, our own esophagus, right? And then that connects to their stomach, which we call the midgut region. And their stomach is pretty big. Uh, and if you've looked at your tardigrades and seen them full of like algae or anything like that, like if they've had green in their stomach, you've probably noticed how full that can get. It takes up a lot of their, their internal body cavity. And then their, uh, their stomach, which we call the midgut, that's connected to uh, the hindgut. And the hindgut is connected to the cloaca where the, uh, any kind of waste will be secreted. So if we move up to the, the top end near the pharynx, near the pharynx, a characteristic of all tardigrades is they have these things called stylets. which are kind of like sharp little teeth that they can uh, push out of their mouth and they'll use their stylets. Uh, some species use their stylets to like stab things. So they'll stab like stab a, a, a cell of a, of a, a, a moss and uh, um, suck out the contents of that moss, of that, the cell that makes up that, uh, uh, of, of a moss. Um, other tardigrades actually uh, like stab other animals and suck whatever's in those animals. Um, so the milnesium, uh, animals that you took uh, pictures of, they're predators. They, they stab other things. They'll, they'll, they'll stab the Ramazodius animals. I've seen it happen. Um, so they'll, they'll use their stylets to uh, stab animals and suck the contents out. The herbivorous ones stab uh, plant cells, suck the contents out. The species that I study, which is called Hypsibius exemplaris, uh, they eat very, very uh, small algal cells. So I don't even think they're really using their stylets for, for much. They're actually just like sucking in these um, these uh, algal cells, uh, you know, right right into their mouth and into their gut. Um, now, in nature, maybe they use their stylets for something, but we feed them we feed them these tiny little uh, algal cells, so they don't need to use them in my lab. But they may use them for other purposes. So we kind of think that they might use their stylets to kind of poke through their eggshell when they're hatching. Um, but in any case, so that that is the. Uh, that is kind of like the, the little anatomy of a tardigrade digestive system and how they use it. Like I said, they'll, they can, different species eat different things. So they use their, use that system differently. Okay. And so how has that evolved or has it? Uh, that's, that's a really great question. So we don't really know, in fact. <laughs> so there, when we look across uh, diversity of animals, we see the same genes kind of controlling development of the same regions of the gut. So we, across animals to make comparisons, we don't really, you know, know if this, you know, like the esophagus of this animal is the same thing as the esophagus of another animal or if it evolved it from an ancestor or they inherited it from an ancestor or this evolved independently. So we're not really sure at that scale, but when we're thinking about phyla, so we're comparing phyla of animals and these phyla evolved, you know, over 550 million years ago. Um, but when we look at how genes control development of, a, of the gut. Very broadly across animals, we have um, a suite of genes that controls development of what we call the foregut. In humans, that would be our mouth and our esophagus. We have a suite of genes that control development of the midgut. And in humans, that would be our stomach and our intestines. Then we have a suite of genes that control development of the hindgut. In humans, that would be uh, like our uh, rectum and anus. Um, Maybe some other parts too. Like I'm not very good at human anatomy either. I study like invertebrate animals, but right. some rough, rough approximation. If anybody, if there's any doctors here to study uh, humans and I'm wrong about that, and I apologize. But anyway, these the foregut, midgut, and hindgut regions uh, uh, can be identified by these gene expression patterns or these gene functions across a, a large diversity of animals. So we're talking from like from a mouse to a fruit fly. Um, and so the idea was like we know tardigrades are weird because they lost a big chunk of their body axis. So how did that affect their gut? Um, and do, will we still see these regions? And so we're going in and I'll, I'll just spoil some of the surprise. Uh, we, we haven't published any of this information yet, but it, hopefully uh, this will be out soon. Um, but we have found that many of those genes that we find 
across animals, playing roles in foregut, midgut, hindgut development are missing in tardigrades. So again, loss. We find the loss of these genes. And we're actually, we're actually expecting to find, if anything, maybe, maybe it's just the midgut genes that are lost, or maybe, you know, we're trying to like, what, what happened to that middle region that was lost? Uh, but what we've actually found, it's, it's always stranger than what we expected. So they do ha still have some of these midgut genes, but instead of just marking what we might consider the middle of the gut, which would be the stomach of a tardigrade, looks like this gene is expressed across the entire gut. So I, we don't even know what to make of that at this point. It doesn't really match any hypothesis we had. It's just more and more, we come up with really great hypotheses and we come up with two different possibilities and then tardigrades are so weird that uh, it doesn't really match anything we, we predicted. So, uh, so far in my experience, that's good. And people really like that. People like weird. Scientists love weird, you know, like the weirder, yes. the better. So, um, so I think we're in, we're, we're in a good position now to show that gut development is really, really weird in tardigrades. Trying to take that, uh, you know, so we're learning about the evolution of gut development in tardigrades. We've learned there's going to be some genes taking on new functions. There's been a loss of genes. Um, so it's, it's very strange. But trying to think about how that relates to what the tardigrade gut looks like or that anatomy is just, I don't even, I don't even know how we're going to get there. It's going to be so hard. Um, I mean, but they have this like pretty basic anatomy that looks like it should play by the rules, but it doesn't. You you keep mentioning genes. Uh, does this mean that the the tardigrade uh, species that you're uh, researching does this mean that its genome has been mapped? So, yes. Yeah, so the the uh, tardigrade species that I study does have a fairly complete genome. There was many groups that were working on that problem, and one group kind of did the best job of it. And this is a group in uh, Japan, uh, by a researcher named uh, Arakawa, uh, and uh, uh, so yeah, so he not only did he uh, in his group kind of map this genome for Hypsibus exemplaris, but they mapped the genome for a, another species, uh, Ramazodius varionatus. So we have two different, nearly completely mapped genomes, so we can go in there and see what's there, what's not there, and. Uh, I know that his group is, their plan is to do like, I don't know, a thousand tardigrade genomes or a hundred tardigrade genomes from all over uh, tardigrade uh, tree of life. So they're, they're always busy like sequencing um, tardigrade genomes. Those are the two that they've published so far, but there will be more to come, which will be really, really exciting, right? So when, once we have sure. some of those marine tardigrades that you've been talking about, we can go through and be like, okay, we know we found some genes over here that help tardigrades survive extreme environments. Do we see these genes in the marine tardigrades? Do they already have them? Or where in this tree do they pop up? So that's their goal. They're going to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of make me wish I had a second life so I'd be, I could become a tardigrade scientist right now. Never too late. Uh, <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Um, I just, I recently interviewed a, um, a CRISPR, like a gene editor mm -hmm. in Switzerland who, who does, uh, you know, research on various human diseases and stuff and gene editing and all that jazz. I'm curious to know if we've mapped the genome of some tardigrades, could we alter the genes and try some things like just to see if they develop a new yeah. segment for well, that's that would be awesome. So that's like that's ex that that's like what everybody wants to do, right? We all want to be able to manipulate the genome and control uh, 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 where genes are expressed and um, uh, kind of really getting a better idea of what these genes are doing, and also be able to like more directly test experiments. So I mean, or test hypotheses. So you know, maybe we, we maybe we could reactivate that posterior growth. Can is it that simple? Can we just turn it back on and do we get a longer tardigrade that would be amazing to be able to do that and so uh we really would like to get that technique you're talking about crispr which is a way of um editing genomes so if you think about editing a uh uh, uh editing like a book or something or a book editor might go in and delete some words or add a word over here that's what we want to do with the genome right we want to do that with tardigrades and the technology exists and that's that crispr uh, cas9 technology that you mentioned so we just need to get that to work in tardigrades and there is a lab that that is uh, uh, working on that, and they've had some they've had some very interesting preliminary data that suggests it's possible, but we don't have the technology available yet. So we're working at it, but we don't have it. Okay, I had to ask again because I've just recently been exposed to this information. Um, 
I also I keep bringing up all these other scientists I've interviewed d- during this uh, this interview, but it's only because it's so related. I also recently interviewed an astrobiologist, oh, cool. and we were talking about you know like the possibility because they're bringing back soil samples from Mars, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what if they find tardigrades in that soil? You know, and and is that something that you've you know sometimes you know, comes across your own mind? Like, what if we do find tardigrades in space? Well, I guess if we found this is this, absolutely. So I think about this all the time. And people are, are often asking me about this, because we know tardigrades can survive in space. They're the only animal that survived the open open vacuum of space. So open vacuum of space has several issues for, for humans and most other life. Uh, it's very, very cold, um, or very, very hot, you know, depending on where you are. If you're, if you're black, if you're uh, away from the sun, it's very cold. If your uh, the sun is shining directly at you, you can get very hot. Um, uh, there's a lot of solar radiation. There's a lot of cosmic radiation, which will destroy the genome of most animals and kill them instantly, or not maybe not instantly, but they're going to be dead soon. There's also no oxygen. Uh, so there's all these issues that uh, most animals just have no chance of surviving. Tardigrades can survive. And so the idea is like, okay, they can survive in space. So what does that mean in terms of are they from space? Maybe well, we know for sure they're from planet Earth, and we know we know for sure they're from planet Earth because we know they're related to uh, animals on planet Earth. So they're like very close related to arthropods, in fact. Um, so we know we actually know like uh, you know their their relationship to other animals. So an animal that or an organism that had come to Earth from another planet wouldn't, wouldn't have any relationship to animals that uh, evolved on Earth. So if we did find tardigrades on Mars. That would suggest that they somehow got there from Earth, right? And so, possible. I mean, we know our planet has been hit by asteroids. We know that even back when uh, the big bolide that killed the dinosaurs, or at least most of the dinosaurs, we know birds are dinosaurs, right? And they're still here, but killed most of the dinosaurs. Um, uh, you know, that would have shot uh, much of our planet up into space, or at least chunks of our planet up into space. And could they have traveled to Mars? We know tardigrades are around. Could they have traveled to Mars? Who knows, you know? So it'd be cool to find tardigrades on Mars. But beyond that, it's even kind of interesting to think about the, the environment of Mars, you know, pretty inhospitable. But there could there be life that's something like a tardigrade that can survive in inhospitable places, right? Maybe it even looks like a tardigrade, but it's not. It's just like independently evolved. Um, so, yeah, I do think about that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Definitely. It's something that's been on my mind for, well, pretty much since they, especially when they said that they were bringing back soil samples from Mars. I mean, this is yeah. the first time we bring back soil from a different planet. Um, I'm, a, I'm pretty sure. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, go ahead, please, please. There was an interesting experiment that took place. Maybe you heard about that, uh, about um, the, the, the tardigrades that, that crashed on the moon recently. Yes, yes. Uh, and so there was an experiment on Earth where they shot tardigrades kind of like bullets to see like what kind of impact they could survive. Um, and it turned out their experiments kind of suggested they probably didn't survive the impact that took place on the moon. But um, I mean, people are even thinking about that. So, I mean, you got to think about tardigrades are flying through space and landing somewhere else. There's going to be an impact. Will they be able to survive that under certain conditions? Maybe other conditions, probably not. So people are thinking about it for sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're going to outlive us. Um, yeah. But uh, so usually at the end of this, uh, these interviews, I, I like to ask the scientists I have on the show to tell me more about what they do outside of science. Uh, yeah. w- before we started recording, you said that you have a ton of interests. Um, I'm curious to know, like, what preoccupies your time outside of, you know, studying tardigrades? Well, right now, what preoccupies my time is my puppy. I bought a puppy. <laughs> I love him so much. Uh, so... Um, I wake up early to take them for a walk. So we take like a hour walk around, around the neighborhood. Um, I'll go to work. My wife is also a faculty member at my uh, university. We try to come home and like, so, you know, after no more than four hours so, so that he doesn't stay in his uh, cage for too long. Then we have this beautiful dog park in Jacksonville that um, has like a, a forest, a lake, some fields. It's like heaven for dogs. Um, um, it feels like it's it's my favorite place in Jacksonville actually now. So I take my dog every day to the dog park, and we go for at least an hour. Um, I also uh, so that that that's what preoccupies my time right now is is my dog. You got You got You get. You can't move on from that without telling me what kind of dog it is. Uh, well, he's a mutt. Um, I oh, bought okay. him at the pound, or I didn't buy him. Well, I did. I guess I did have to pay some money, but um, I got him at the pound. So we did we did a DNA test, and he is. Uh, he had one parent. The DNA test was really cool because we got a family tree back, and he had one parent that was a full pit bull, 
The other parent, parent was a real mutt that, that traced back to four different uh, ancestors. So the great parent, the great grandparents of that dog included a pit bull, a German shepherd, a husky, and a, wow. uh, and a chow chow. So uh, right now I'm preoccupied by my dog, but I think uh, I, like, like, like other people, I enjoy just normal things. You know, I'm not like here studying textbooks all day long or, or all night long. So right now I'm really interested in the NBA playoffs. <laughs> so I'm watching a lot of basketball. All oh, right. Uh, um, Who's your team? Uh, uh, I don't have a team. I just really like the NBA. Right, right now, I'm kind of hoping the Suns. Oh no, I'm. Go- I think I might be going for the Bucks. I like the Suns and the Bucks, so I think they're the two teams that I want to make it to the finals. So that's very unusual. Yeah. You know that, right? For somebody to watch sports and not have a team. Yeah, you know what? I, I what it is is I uh, I got into basketball kind of late. I mean, I always like to play basketball, but I got into like even watching sports in general pretty kind of later in my life. And uh, uh, I don't know. I just never had a team. I don't know. I don't. I don't feel a strong allegiance to any teams. I like to watch sports, but I don't really feel a strong allegiance to any teams. Um, uh, so I'm watching basketball. I really like watching movies. I like music. You know what I mean. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I used to play in rock and roll bands before I became a scientist. And even while I was still in graduate school, I still would. Um, I've kind of lost ambition there, but you know, I, li- I like playing music. Uh, I do like art, so I thought it was cool that you were an artist. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I interview really like artists art and, and scientists. Yeah, right? that's why I was so, really excited to, to be on yeah. this podcast. Is I really like art, and I do think there is there there are similarities between science scientists and artists. I think the difference is yes. uh, scientists have uh, 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 no fashion sense. You know what I mean? Like we don't have any fashion <laughs> sense, but creativity wise, it's very similar. And I think playing music and uh, try like my thing was always just uh, I played my I used to play my guitar every day and I'd almost just make up like three or four songs every day and I almost never played any other songs and I didn't or anybody else's songs I was just never interested in doing that but uh, I guess kind of like thinking about that and what works what doesn't work and what I like I like the sound of this I don't like that and just kind of thinking about that and that would help me a lot when I'm as a scientist uh, almost yes. every day just having like no, having taste, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna say I have good taste, but I have taste. I like there's things I like and things I don't like. And like going into everything with that, with that mindset is very valuable to me. Um, yeah, it, it is absolutely valuable. And what I found is, is it such a similar um, curiosity between artists and scientists so yeah. much so, so that a lot of uh, scientists are actually, you know, musicians on the side or they paint on the side. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of artists are very curious about the natural world. You know, mm-hmm. it, it inspires their work. I've always seen it as, um, you know, a scientist is somebody who tries to perhaps uncover the truth or, uh, you know, facts, whereas an artist tries to express what they feel and what they see yeah. so it's a different way to translate the world absolutely and, and you're right i think like almost i don't know it's a very high proportion of the scientists that i know you know i know sculptors i know painters i know photographers um uh yeah i know a, a lot of musicians um i have a really great artist that works in my lab mandy game who like drew like some of our specimens for uh for our manuscript that we wrote together. And you might see some, we have this whiteboard and you'll see it in my picture, this whiteboard in the back, you'll see little drawings of these like Cambrian fossil animals, like her interpretation on the whiteboard. So she'll draw like pictures on the whiteboard and the whiteboard is meant to be like, we need some more pipette tips and that kind of thing. But this art ends up there and none of us want to erase it. So now it's just like an artboard almost. <laughs> yeah, I used to do that at work actually, right? I mean, I've been working in tech for like 20 years. And at one point we had these empty whiteboards that we weren't using. And I started drawing like, you know, uh, scenes from various p- old paintings, you know, like the, um, you know, the American one with the the guy with the the hay, uh, what do you call those? The, like the hay, American Gothic, that oh, painting. Yep, yep, yep. So I drew that on a whiteboard and oh, then cool. people were like, that's okay. That's unusual, but then you know. <laughs> they don't want to erase it. Right. So like, no, exactly. let's leave that up there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, look, Frank, it's been so much fun having you on the show. Um, there's so much to know about tardigrades and there's so much more to learn. And, you know, I, I really, um, I'm going to get you to send me those links, um, yeah, you know, with regards to how to find marine tardigrades and, and anything else you can send me because I really, you know, I get, a, I feel a lot of questions about tardigrades. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not an, an expert obviously, but there's, I, there is a lot of interest yeah. on them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm only an expert on the fastest of tardigrades that I study. Um, so, um, 
you know, but I, I do know a lot about tardigrades in general. I go to the tardigrade meetings and learn more there, but you know, um, how, do, how do we get an invite to the tardigrade meetings? <laughs> uh, I don't think you'd need an invite. I think you would just have to, uh, have to, you know, go. So yeah, I feel I like I, I... Posny in Poland. So Ooh. yeah. And uh, after that, down. it's going to be somewhere in Japan. So, um, they're usually in really nice places. So I've gone to, uh, I've gone to uh, Denmark. So I went to Copenhagen. I went to Modena, Italy. Um, so there's been there's been some nice meetings. So just to be precise here, is this a society of? of uh, it is a society. Or... Yes, it's okay. a society. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Do you guys wear capes? Uh, no capes. No, I'm thinking oh. about the. I've ever seen any. Weird costumes. I haven't, but we have really fancy uh, dinners together, though. So, okay. um, in Italy, we had dinner in the courtyard of a castle, uh, and in um, Denmark, we had dinner in a museum in this like really old room that had a had a long table, like the kind of table that you'd see in Game of Thrones, where you can wow. fit like a hundred people around it, and it's this giant, and they're yelling "skull" the whole time, you know, because we're in <laughs> we're in a uh, uh, Denmark, so uh, we it does get fun sometimes. Yeah. See, this is why you you guys need more scientists studying tardigrades. This is all yeah. the perks you get, guys. Yeah, exactly. um, so go and study tardigrades. We need more. <laughs> yeah. um, so on that note, Frank, um, thanks again for coming on the program. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. Thanks for you know sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, what can I say? I, I didn't even know there was somebody out there studying the evolution. Uh, side of things so this is a real treat so i really appreciate it thank you Uh, i was happy to be here thanks for having me